So I want to talk about callings, because for me, much of playing big has expressed itself in following my callings, and that's how I see it coming alive in a practical sense for so many women. This is my definition of a calling. There's a lot of different definitions out there. My definition is it's the inner assignment that we receive. It's an assignment from a mysterious source. We don't make it up or choose it, we receive it. And it's an assignment to bring light or love into the world in a particular way. So how many of you have ever felt you got stalled at some point in your journey because you were looking for your purpose or your calling? Kind of stuck, yeah. It happens to a lot of us because there's this idea floating around, what's my purpose, what's my calling, I need to find the answer, nothing feels right. My take is we all have the same purpose. So I can, if you're still wondering about this question, maybe we can just take care of it right now, which is to bring light and love into the world. That we have come into a world with a lot of brokenness and a lot of darkness, and that we each share a fundamental purpose to bring in small, often mundane, pockets of light and love. But that that greater force of life and love comes through each of us in a unique way. We are a prism, each of us a unique prism, based on our life circumstances and our gifts for how that light and love is going to express itself. And the calling is just the specific expression of that. I think one of the huge myths that's disserviced us is that we each only get one calling. I think we get many, and that they're fluid, and that they come and go, and that when one ends, it doesn't mean it wasn't real. So when I think about callings, I think about my friend Nikki, who felt an assignment to carry around in her purse little Ziploc bags of travel size, toothpaste and soap and shampoo, and hand them out when she sees someone asking for money on the street. She felt called to take that specific action to bring light and love into the world. And I think about callings to parent, to adopt, to take care of a person in your community going through an illness, as well as callings to a 20-year career or to become an activist on a particular issue. So that we can define this really broadly. And there are seven clues that I see showing up for women again and again in how our callings show up and how we can recognize them. And I'll move through these quickly uh, but hopefully you'll recognize some callings that have been whispering to you that maybe you haven't noticed before. So here's how our callings tend to show up. We usually either feel a particular pain around some aspect of brokenness in the, or darkness in the world that just won't leave us alone. Like, we all know every time you look at the news, right, you see 20 headlines that really disturb you, but then sometimes there's one that keeps tugging at your heart, like you, you have something to do with that issue. That's what I'm talking about there. Sometimes we get the flip side of that, number two is a little more pleasant, where instead of the pain, we get a persistent vision of how some aspect of the status quo could be different. So you just can't stop picturing the community garden that you see at your kid's school. You can't stop thinking about your idea for how the whole healthcare system could be reorganized, <laughs> right? Or you have in mind this distinctive, interesting jewelry that you've never seen out there before, and that vision won't leave you alone, and you want to bring that into the world. Number three is this sense of assignment. There's some sense of, I didn't exactly make this up or choose this, it's certainly not what would be the most convenient path, but I feel assigned to this work. I feel somehow this is mine to do. Number four is this sense of flow and momentum that we get when we're actually doing the thing. Now this is not to be confused with number five, which is how we feel every moment we're not 
doing the thing, but thinking about doing it. <laughs> we do not feel excited about our callings then. We do not feel eager to jump into them. We feel huge resistance towards our callings. And this is often an uh-oh moment for people. <laughs> so if you're having that now, that's quite, quite normal. That we think we're supposed to feel all in love with our callings all the time. And that's not the truth. We actually very strongly resist our callings because they take us out of our comfort zone. And they ask us to leave the herd and not do what everybody else is doing. And they ask us to be vulnerable and encounter all that discomfort that Brene was talking about last night. And the two last uh-oh moments I will expose you to now, unfortunately, are that with our callings generally at the outset, we don't have everything we need to have to do them. And we are not who we need to be yet. So we've got an objection Rolodex going on <laughs> of why we shouldn't go for our callings. Here's our objection Rolodex. Could say a lot of things about all of these. Some of them probably found, sound familiar to you. Underneath it all, I'm scared, I'm scared, I'm scared. Right? You've probably had some conversations with friends where they've kind of talked you out of objection number one, then objection number two pops up. Yeah, scared. So let's talk about fear for a few minutes. I encountered a teaching about fear a few years ago that dramatically changed how I understood the fears we face about playing bigger and the fears we face about going for our callings. This is Rabbi Alan Liu, passed away a few years ago, sadly. But he talks about in his book how in the Old Testament, in ancient Hebrew, there are two words for fear, two different terms are used. The first word is pahad. And the definition of pahad is the fear of projected or imagined things. So this is our overreactive lizard brain fear, right? This is what we feel uh, when we're worrying we're going to horribly embarrass ourselves or um, when we um, feel like taking an emotional risk just feels like uh, life-threatening. Here's the other word that's used for fear in the Old Testament. This is pronounced yira. And there's three types of circumstances where this word for fear shows up. It's the fear that overcomes us when we inhabit a larger space than we're used to. The feeling we experience when we suddenly come into possession of more energy than we had before. And what we feel when we're in the presence of the divine. Interesting, huh? This is Elizabeth is a graduate of the Playing Big program. She told her kids about these two terms, and they got it right away. They defined pachad as the kind of fear you feel when the nightlight is not on, when you need to go down the hall and it's dark, scary rides, and they got yira. It's how I feel when I'm doing the spring concert performance. It's how I feel when I'm thinking about high school. It's how I feel when I'm going on a trip on a plane. So, back to that for a moment. So yura is how we feel when we're going for our callings. And it's how we feel when we step into playing bigger. And it's how we often feel as emerging women. Yura feels a lot like pachad. They feel the same. So it can be easy to confuse this very sacred kind of fear with regular old fear. But what I got when I read this teaching was that again and again, as women step into playing bigger, they feel yura. And when we simply name it as fear, we can jump into our habitual or patterned reaction to fear and retreat or fight or flight or defend or think we need to shore ourselves up. But that if we can name yura as yura when it's happening, we can actually just welcome it and savor it and know that it means we're on the right track. 